The power of data is undeniable. Uh, it is the potential to change lives and provide insights that were previously unimaginable. However, such power is not constrained to only being used for good. There are equal potential for the data to be used for, to cause harm, to exploit, and to potentially disadvantage. Furthermore, for digital, the digital nature of data means that once it's released, it's very difficult to recall. It's easy to copy, it's easy to share, but it's very difficult to recall or change. As such, the decision as to whether we should or should not release that data at any particular point is critical to get right. If we get it wrong, there's very little we can do to prevent harm in the future. And when undertaking such decisions, we must be aware of the potential harm that that data can cause and not just look at it from an idealised point of view as the benefits that could happen. And given the, the criticality of that decision, one would expect that the field of open data would be one of precision and clarity in the terms of definitions that it uses. Unfortunately, it's not. It's one of ambiguity and really poorly defined terms. Um, a good example of this is exactly what open government data includes. Depending on your definition, it could be data which is solely about the government itself, its operations, what it does. Or alternatively, it could be all data that the government holds. That distinction is vital since the, the expectation of privacy in the two contexts are poles apart. In the case of data related to the government, there, there's no, clearly no justifiable reason why the operations of the government on an everyday basis should remain private. Governments should be open to transparency, they should be accountable to the public, and except in a few cases of some areas of national security, what they do should be available to be seen by everyone. There clearly is no expectation the privacy of their everyday actions should exist. In contrast, if we consider open data to involve all data held by the government, much of that data has been collected and with, during an interactions in which you had an expectation of privacy. For example, health records, tax returns, interactions with the welfare state are all conducted under the premise of privacy. Making such data open is at odds with how it was being collected. And it could even be argued that such data does not belong to the government. It is only the custodian of that data. Furthermore, many such collections are compulsory. So if you do have a privacy concern, you cannot choose to opt out. Irrespective of what the, the original intention behind open government data was, today it is frequently considered to mean the, the broader definition of that it's all data which the government holds. If we look at the 2013 executive order issued by President Obama making open data the default in the USA, it clearly encompasses a wide variety of data held by the government. However, whilst it is broad in its definition of what can be released, it prioritises privacy and it says, Executive departments and agencies shall ensure that they safeguard individual privacy, confidentiality and national security. And it goes on to state that it is vital that agencies not release information if doing so would violate any law or policy or jeopardise privacy, confidentiality or national security. Both statements are strong in their advocacy of privacy. If we look at the Australian context, the most recent equivalent is Australia's first open government national action plan. It commits to release high-value data sets and enable data-driven innovation. Its equivalent privacy condition states, it is of the utmost importance, though, that we, the release of data not compromise people's privacy and personal details. I would argue that that's, uh, that statement is considerably weaker. The equivalent statement than the equivalent statement made by President Obama. The notion of non-release of data is not mentioned, and the language leaves open the possibility of compromise. The notion of privacy is further discussed in a later section looking at how to build and maintain public trust and goes as far as to say, in some cases, it is not appropriate to publish or share certain data sets. The Privacy Act 1988 underpins the open data agenda and helps build public trust in data sharing activities. However, it still seems to place the protection of privacy as a caveat, not a primary objective of the release. It does not explicitly state under what circumstances data should not be released instead deferring to the Privacy Act. As we shall see, the Privacy Act is not well placed to be used as a guide for the release of data. If we accept the notion that high value data about the public should be made open, and we assume that in spite of some lukewarm privacy assertions previously, the government does in fact care about the protection of individual privacy, 
we should move to look at what methods are used to protect that privacy in the release of the data. The most widely used privacy preserving technique applied to open data is de-identification. Unfortunately, its definition is almost as bad as the other areas as well. The Privacy Act defines de-identification as personal information is de-identified if the information is no longer about an identifiable individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. The corresponding definition of personal information shares the term reasonably identifiable, stating personal information means information or an opinion about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. Both definitions fail to explicitly define what reasonably identifiable means. Does reasonably identifiable refer to the person performing the re-identification? And if so, how do we quantify what reasonab reasonability is? The ambiguity is recognised by other organisations. Uh, the National Statement on the Ethical Conduct of Human Research states, the National Statement avoids the term de-identified data as its meaning is unclear. Where it's sometimes used to, to defer, refer to a record that cannot be linked to an individual, non-identifiable, it also used to refer to a record in which identifying information has been removed, but the means still exist to re-identify the individual. The debate over reasonably identifiable is also not new, and is subject to extensive discussion as part of the Australian Law Reform Commission's report into the privacy law in 2008. However, in spite of a number of concerns being raised and recommendations being made, the ambiguity has not been resolved. In trying to resolve this ambiguity, we can look at how other countries have approached it. If we look at the UK's Information Commissioner's Office Guidance on Identifiability, it states an individual is identified if you have distinguished that individual from other members of a group. That is a useful definition for evaluating de-identification. Since it provides a quantifiable test, and can, can you identify an individual from anyone else in that group of that release? It's a good start, but as we shall see, it's a bit too narrow. And even if an individual cannot be immediately distinguished, re-identification can still take place and harm can still be caused. It does, however, provide a good example of when you should definitely not release a data set. Conceptually, the identification attempts to create the aforementioned indistinguishability. Most approaches apply to unit record level data, which is data sets in which each record of that data is about one individual, are based on a concept known as k-anonymity. Broadly speaking, k-anonymity aims to establish that for any record, there are k-1 other records that are indistinguishable based on a set of quasi-identifiers. And by quasi-identifiers, it's basically certain columns in your data set. Typically, this involves suppressing obvious identifiers, either completely or partially. For example, you might delete names, you might shorten an address to just a postcode. Um, other areas, you might aggregate data into classes, so for example, age 20 to 25, 25 to 30, and other data will be perturbed. And what perturbed means is that you just add a random value to it. So for example, you, you plus or minus 10 days to each date in an idea to create some unknown quantity into the data set. Anonymity has been shown to fail on most high dimensional data sets, which are often the most interesting data sets available. And it has even failed on lower dimensional data. Furthermore, k-anonymity is often applied incorrectly. For example, it incorrectly assumes that each row in the record in the data set is independent, when in fact, in a longitudinal data set, they are often related. They often relate to the same person. In such circumstances, each row may achieve k-anonymity, but collectively they do not. For example, knowing the order in which someone had, say, for example, broken their leg, then had a heart attack, and then suffered pneumonia, could be identifying. Yet each of those events individually is, not ind is indistinguishable from k-1 other events. As the, dimension set, as the dimensions of the data set grows, it becomes infeasible to even determine indistinguishability. When de-identification fails, it's referred to as re-identification, which is the process of recovering information beyond that which was intended to be released. Importantly, it does not necessarily require re-identification of a named individual, or even distinguishability beyond a small group to cause harm. For example, being able to identify a group of records in which an individual exists, and if that group all exhibit a particular attribute, so for example, if you have a group in which everybody exhibits heart disease, you may not know which record belongs to that individual, but just knowing they're part of that group determines you can tell they have heart disease. Even given the above the identification techniques, full re-identification is surprisingly common, it's surprisingly easy. It's not complex, it's not a mathematical task, it's fundamentally just a database in a join.
The challenge is finding sufficient auxiliary data on which to perform that join. As such, the risk of re-identification is really closely related to the state of the release environment, what data is already out there. And this presents a particular problem, in that you, it is impossible for a releasing agency to know the state of the release environment, because that release environment encompasses all public data, all data that's been out previously, all data which has been obtained illegally via breaches, and all private data sets. It's clearly impossible for any individual to know that. Furthermore, the calculation is only done the day the calculation is done, it is only relevant for the past. It bears no resemblance to the risk in the future. As new data becomes released, so does the risk of re-identification. This apparent fallacy of the identification is not new. It's widely recognised in the information security field and received coverage in the field of law. Paul Omer, professor of law at Georgetown University Law Centre, wrote his paper Broken Promises of Privacy, responding to the surprising failure of an anonymization in 2009. The abstract of which perfectly summarises the problem. An extract reads, Scientists have demonstrated they can often re-identify or de-anonymise individuals hidden in on anonymised data with astonishing ease. By understanding this research, we realise we have made a mistake. Laboured under a a label laboured up beneath a fundamental misunderstanding, which has assured us much less privacy than we have assumed. This mistake pervades nearly every information privacy law, regulation, debate, yet reg regulators and legal scholars have paid it scant attention. It's worth noting again that this paper was written in 2009. That predates both President Obama's executive order to open that data, and it predates open government partnership action plans to release high value public data. Yet there's been no significant development or counter to the failings identified in Paul Ohm's paper. It is not that we have solved the problem, we are just continuing to labour beneath the same fundamental misunderstanding. Ohm's paper provides a thorough analysis of the field and is remarkably prescient even going as far as to correctly predict that governments would respond to the evidence of re-identification by trying to ban re-identification, which he concludes will fail anyway because re-identification is something you can do largely in private. You don't need to do anything publicly to be seen to do it, so unless you admit to doing it, nobody can tell. And re-identification is not a theoretical problem either. Open data highways littered with de-identification failures. An early example was the Massachusetts Gov Group Insurance Commission release of state employee hospital visits which allowed Latanya Sweeney to recover the governor of Massachusetts record, medical records, print them out and post them back to him. Further examples were the AOL data release of search queries allowing identification of a member of public purely based on what they had searched for, uh, the New York taxi release of every trip in 2013 and more recently the Department of Health's MBS PBS data release. It's difficult to think of a single large-scale release of unit record level data about individuals that has not led to some form of re-identification. This raises the obvious question as why, in spite of the evidence to the contrary, do governments continue to believe the identification works? Whilst we can only speculate as to the real reasons, we can look at the consequences were we to accept the failure of the identification. As Paul Ohm pointed out, it would impact on nearly all privacy laws, regulations and policies. It would impact on the terms and conditions of most online services, many of which rely on the notion of being able to anonymise data in order to collect it and sell it on. It would have significant impact on open data and on open government initiatives that have become entwined with the notion of releasing data about the public. The impact on open data would also spread to research as a result of the increasing, increasing conflation of open data and research data. There are just too many groups within society that would be negatively impacted by the acceptance of failure of the identification. As a result, we end up in a situation where data sets are released as de-identified, in spite of being evident to a number of people that they are not. We see laws like the re-identification amendment proposed that would criminalise those who point out when government de-identification fails, which begs the question, if someone is able to re-identify an individual from a de-identified data set, is it not evidence of the individual being reasonably identifiable? In which case, is it not a breach of the Privacy Act? The examples of instances of re-identification demonstrate that the problem of re-identification is not isolated to government releases. If anything, we should be more concerned with the amount of supposedly de-identified data that is being collected, analysed and shared in the commercial sector. The amount of data held by corporations dwarfs that held by government, but its exchange and use, use happens largely behind closed doors and without oversight. That said, data collected by the government sits in a different context to commercial data. Interactions with business are largely optional or can be conducted in such a way as to minimise data collection, for example, paying with cash, not having a loyalty card or choosing a business based on its privacy policy.
Interactions with government are not optional. They are either out of necessity or compulsory. You do not have a choice of which tax office you file your tax return to or which border agency you choose to use when you enter or leave the country. There is no choice of a welfare state provider or medical administrator. Being a member of society involves a tacit acceptance that government will collect data about you. However, the amount of data it collects is not equal. A strong determinant of how much data will be collected is wealth. The wealthier an individual, the less they need to interact with government services and therefore the less data they need to hand over. In contrast, the more dependent an individual is on the state, the greater the data that will be collected. This in itself is not a problem. It stands to reason that the more an individual is dependent on a service, the more they will interact with it and the larger their data footprint. If no data is openly released or only ag aggregate data is openly released, all, all participants are largely equal in their privacy exposure. However, once a policy of opening data is introduced, the individual with a greater data footprint faces a greater risk of privacy exposure. They are more likely to be included in the released data set simply, simply due to the fact that they're present, is in, they're present in more government data sets. As a result, they're likely to have a greater quantity of auxiliary data in the release environment already, and therefore their re-identification risk is also increased. As such, the potential privacy of opening high-value data sets about individuals is not equitably distributed. It is disproportionately faced by those most dependent on the state, which are often the most vulnerable and those with the least well placed to defend their privacy or advocate its protection. In terms of the privacy, in terms of privacy for the case for not making individual unit record level data open, the case is strong. However, we cannot ignore the impact it will have on research. The conflation of open data and research data is particularly concerning. It serves to not only shield open government data from legitimate privacy criticisms, but it also creates a dependence on the continuing release of ever more sensitive data. The Productivity Commission report on data availability and use demonstrated the difficulty in accessing high quality research data with delays of years being incurred if the data was even ever released. However, open data is not the solution to the problem of poor access to research data. Clearly, as a society, it is beneficial to provide efficient access for scientific research to high quality research data. Such access is most suitably provided via secure research environments that impose the necessary restrictions on the data use and release. Such an approach is used in many other countries, and once we accept that we cannot de-identify the data, it becomes obvious that, that all such data about individuals should only be released into such an environment. Which leaves us to the question of what purpose open government data will serve if it no longer includes releasing the individual data about the population. I would advocate that it returns to its original, narrow, narrow purpose of prov providing data about the operations of government, which we know the power data has to provide insight and therefore the oversight of its subjects. Applying it to the operation of government would greatly improve transparency and accountability. The open by default should have been and should now be applied to data about the government. Far too much government data is either difficult to access, protected by spurious national security claims, or delivered in a format that makes it difficult to analyse and monitor. For example, the Register of Members' Interests in the Australian Parliament is published on the Parliament website. However, it is in the form of PDF scanned from letters and forms with a mix of type and handwriting. In 2017, such data should be being submitted electronically, if feed in an open format to allow automatic monitoring and analysis. The same is true of parliamentarians' expenses, which are summarised on a web page and then released in more detailed, ge automatically generated PDF files. Such data and many other data sets should be being released in a machine-readable format, compliant with open data guidelines. In addition, source code from many government processes should be open source, in particular for applications like vote counting and the running of elections. We must resist the temptation to use the release of public data as a way of complying with open government obligations. Releasing data about the public does not provide greater transparency of the government or help improve trust in the institution of government. If anything, the lax attitude to privacy shown in the past could even undermine trust. The purpose of open government was to improve the quality of the democracy operating within a country by shining a light on the parts of the government that have for too long operated in the shadows. That will not be achieved by shining a light on the public. To summarise, we must accept the fallacy of de-identification and adapt to its failure. As, as a result, we can no longer openly release unit record level data about individuals. Consequently, we, we must dramatically improve our research data provisions to counter the loss of open data. Open government data remains essential in achieving open government, but, it, but such release mu releases must be about the government itself, not the population. We know the power data has to provide info, insight and therefore the oversight of its subject.
We must strive for greater oversight of the government, not greater oversight of ourselves.